Welcome to Do Beautiful Things. I'm your host, Jenny Lawson, President and CEO of Keep America Beautiful. In this podcast, we'll discuss ending litter, the truth behind recycling, and making communities beautiful for people and for a more sustainable future. We'll be talking to industry experts, community leaders, and everyday people who want to do the right thing, including from time to time, my mother. Thank you for joining us. I hope you learn something, and I know I will. Welcome back to Do Beautiful Things, and thank you for joining us for our Recycling Reality Check series. This series will break down the myths and bring forth the facts of recycling. It's a topic that can be confusing to many. In today's episodes, we'll assess the sustainability of paper and packaging and learn how eco-friendly these products really are and discover what this industry is doing to benefit both consumers and the planet. So let's dive right in. I am uh, pleased to introduce Marianne Hansen today. She is the president of the Paper and Packaging Board, where she is responsible for communicating the paper industry's unrivaled sustainability story to millions of consumers. Marianne is a paper and packaging enthusiast and is the perfect person to join us for today's conversation. Marianne, welcome. Hi, Jenny. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I am very excited about this conversation because from what I understand, you know, paper and packaging are really amongst the most recycled items out there. That's that's right. Right. This past year, um, we were proud to announce a 68 percent recycled rate, meaning that 68 percent of the paper and packaging that was put out in the system, if you will, for all the different things we use it for was actually returned through recycling. Wow. That's really exciting. And so tell me a little bit about the paper and packaging board. What what do you all do uh, in that process? So the paper and packaging board is really, um, it's it's a group of individual companies, 48 total, who have decided to band together for the purposes of marketing. And there's a long history of these types of programs in our country where uh, the United States Department of Agriculture has allowed agricultural products like beef, like trying to think peanuts, honey, avocados, eggs. Most consumers are very familiar with programs from those industries that really tout their nutritional benefits and why these are, many of them are food-based, why these are are good things to eat. And so while we don't eat paper, our program is overseen by the USDA and the industry had to put it together. They had to show, you know, considerable support for it. And then it was enacted in 2014. And so we put out advertising and education campaigns that are much like what you would see from the beef industry. Beef, it's what's for dinner, the incredible edible egg caught in the fabric of our lives. And so our industry's campaign is paper and packaging, how life unfolds. And what we really focus on today is all of the sustainable benefits of paper-based products, whether it's paper, cards, magazines, shipping boxes, food packaging. It's very present in our lives. And we are really focused on telling the sustainability story because there's a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding about the sustainability of forests in particular, because forests and and tree pulp is the source of of packaging. So, So let's jump into that, right? So the sustainability of paper, right? Because to your point, paper pulp for paper is a tree based product. So Talk to us about the the sustainability narrative around paper. So relative to the forest, consumers want to believe that, you know, that trees are being grown for the purposes of reducing carbon in our uh, atmosphere, for instance. But consumers don't understand that the trees that are used to make paper-based products, they are grown much like a crop. And while we don't think something that takes 20 or 30 years to grow as a crop, the reality is trees are very intentionally grown and raised for the purposes of creating products that we rely on. And so we're really trying to tackle that myth that there's deforestation going on here in the United States. And that's simply not the case. There's certainly a lot of challenges to our forests today. We know fire, for example, and a, and a, a climate that's much drier, uh, for example, are really um important challenges. Insects, for example, there's a lot of things out there, but but consumers, people 
think of trees as something very sacred, right? That they, they're there to live and breathe and, and grow and reduce carbon. And the fact is they're, and all of the products of paper are largely recycled. And so it is a very important and well-maintained and protected resource. And it's grown by often small family landowners who over the years, you know, harvest different parts of their property, but also replant in order to have, you know, trees available for all the things that we, you know, rely on. It's, it's really interesting. So there's certainly the, the rotated crop and farmed trees, basically, at scale. Talk to me also about the role that recycling paper and, and pulp, paper pulp for new products. How, do, how does that work in the paper industry? So one of the reasons our products are so recyclable is they are natural, tree-based, pulp and paper fibers are, you know, again, a source from nature. And so in the U.S., you know, we, on the flip side of it, are able to get that material back. And we're always trying to get more and more back into the system, the recycling system, so that those fibers can be used to make something new. And so we often will point to the fact that most paper products can be recycled at least seven times. And so, you know, that pizza box that, you know, you put in the recycling after dinner last night could become your cereal box, you know, uh, down the stream when the box is recycled. And so, you know, the paper fibers are inherently renewable, they're inherently recyclable, and it's just making sure that we get that fiber back. And that's really where, you know, we, we have a lot of alignment with KAB. Recycling is so important to getting our material back. The problem is consumers often, you know, are confused and they might not even be confused about paper. They can be confused about a lot of different things. And they don't realize, I think, sometimes that recycling is a very dynamic process and that it's always becoming better iterations of ourselves and what we can recycle. And so we, we kind of think we've got this down cold and then, or you learn something one way, but then, and, you know, several years later, it might change. Pizza box recycling is a great example of that. It has been believed for many, many years that any kind of food contamination that you know touches packaging shouldn't be recycled. And the reality is those fibers in pizza box have a lot of life left in them and can be recycled even with a little bit of you know residual grease and cheese. So, you know, we definitely discourage people, you know, you don't throw a pizza away that you haven't eaten um, in the box. You have to empty it. And uh, with a lot of the packaging, we we tell consumers to flatten it. Then it'll really be ready for recycling. Food contamination relative to pizza boxes shouldn't be an issue if people have taken out the majority, you know, of the food. But that's, that's something people learned a long time ago. Oh, we right. can't recycle anything with food, touching it or leaving some residual. And the, the recycling is so far advanced from there. Great. Let, let's bust a couple of the other myths. So these are the ones that have come up in our house this week. So one is milk cartons. Uh, recycling, I'm sure you're aware, can be very, very regional and local. And so you always need to check back with your local guidelines. But I know here in Fairfax County, Virginia, where I live, milk cartons are, in fact, recyclable. And we know that more than 60 percent of consumers in the U.S., have access to milk carton recycling. So that's a product that continues to grow and you do have to check locally. But I know today where I live, very much part of the recycling stream. Thank you. We have uh, talked with, in a, in a previous episode, the folks at the Recycling Partnership who now have a ability for you to take the QR code on that milk carton and get the information for your location for just what to do with it. So always that's our advice. But it's great to hear because it's a little confusing with that plastic, you know, lid on it these days. You don't know quite exactly what to do. The other one that's perplexed me lately, here we are 48 hours after Cyber Monday. So everybody's starting to get things in the mail. And it's exciting to see increasingly those things delivered in paper-based packaging, but sometimes they have bubble wrap inside of them. Like it's paper on the outside, but bubble wrap on the inside. What do we know about what to do in that situation? 
So that is a very common concern, you know, on the part of consumers. What we recommend, empty, flatten, and recycle. So the box itself could have a little bit of tape on it or uh, something that is holding the label, for example, and you take off of, um, as much as you can. But the, the a lot of the contents in that box have to be removed as well, especially if they are plastic-based. What can be recycled does vary from community to community. But what we're definitely seeing is because of that e-commerce you know, lift that we saw during COVID, it was growing anyway. And of course, it was just accelerated when we were all relying on packages to come to our home. And so consumers, I often saw just even in my own little neighborhood, people would put the boxes out, but they wouldn't break them down. And, and so that creates confusion for the waste management you know, folks that pick up our trash in particular. And so we always advise consumers to, to break down that box and to make sure that it doesn't have other things in it. Increasingly, though, we are seeing a lot of substitutions for plastic packaging that are really exciting. So, for example, let's say you bought a, a shirt from a nice retail store. A lot of times it'll come to you in a plastic bag rather than a box. And that plastic bag is not recyclable, or at least it's not in the local trash you know, um, or local recycling here. You can take it to a store and maybe they can do something with it. I know our stores, for example, um, grocery stores collect plastic uh, grocery bags. But what we're seeing is a lot of innovation now in the plastic industry, excuse me, in the paper industry to create paper-based solutions for all kinds of plastics, whether it's fillers and boxes, you know, that need to cushion products to keep them safe, or, you, you know, you've got one sort of soft product that can easily fit in a, a, a sleeve. Those sleeves now are available in many, many places in, in paper. And even just the, that beautiful shirt you just bought probably came in a plastic bag in the, the plastic container that it mailed in. And again, we are now seeing in the industry everything from uh, paper shrink wrap to paper-based bags to hold your individual items within a bigger you know, set of packaging, whether it's a box or a bag, et cetera. So there's a lot of innovation happening now to really reduce as much of that unnecessary plastic packaging that yeah. is more difficult to recycle. And, th and that's the challenge. There's just so many types of products and packages out there, and it can be overwhelming for the consumer. Well, that certainly points to, you know, an increased demand for recycled material, right? If we are all getting, if there's innovation happening that are that is bringing more paper product into the house, in, in place of plastics. And I know from my personal experience over the years, we've really increased the use of recycled paper for any printing that we have to do, uh, you know, and, and many other parts of our lives now involve recycled paper. Talk to me a little bit about the demand side. How, how does the demand side work for that recycled paper? The cost of uh, recycled paper can really vary wildly um, during COVID. You know, we couldn't get enough, right? Because there was so much production going on on the packaging side. So uh, again, what we're really committed to at the paper and, plastic, uh, paper and Packaging Board is making sure that we're encouraging consumers to, you know, put those packages uh, in their magazines and their mail that, you know, they've gone through and they're done with it, get it back in the system so that we can then make more products with it. And we're only as strong, honestly, as people are uh, recyclers. The good news is a typical brown box is more than likely 50%, at least 50% recycled fiber and paper that you use in your office. Um, you can buy it, you know, with recycled content in it. Um, what's really important for the overall system here um, in the U.S. and paper is that there's always going to need to be virgin paper coming into the system to increase then the, the amount of recycled paper, right, that we have access to. So there's a really important balance there that has to happen. And sometimes consumers get very focused on you know, or, or customers, you know, they want something that's made from 100% recycled content. And that certainly is available, but um, got to have virgin fiber or we will run out of recycled material. And so that's why for us getting back to that whole tree story is so important. A lot of the misinformation consumers hear about forests 
really have to do um, often with third world countries and, and countries that have growing populations and need farmland or need places for people to live. And so trees get displayed because of other needs in the community. And here in the United States, you know, we are very, very strict and careful about making sure that our industry, anyway, making sure that we are not using more than we're putting back. So we're always going to need the trees and the fiber to make paper-based products. But the good news is those fibers get used over and over. We know at least seven times in most cases. And so consumers, when they get a brown box, they have got a box that has come from a combination of recycled fiber and new fiber. And depending on the usage, that content goes up or down. Even some recycled content is wonderful as 100% recycled because we need that content. We need that you know, virgin fiber, that new fiber to keep the whole system going. At the beginning, we talked about this sort of 68% recycle rate for paper, right? Which is very exciting. Like, why do you think consumers understand paper recycling better than other things? What what are the, the lessons learned or the behaviors that you all have messaged over the years that, that has supported that level of recycling? Well, I think, you know, for the paper industry, the ability, first of all, just to have a strong recycling infrastructure. The industry has been investing in it for years and has put in millions if, and millions, if not billions of dollars in the last few years to keep recycling, you know, uh, up and running. And they've been planning for all this e-commerce that accelerated because of COVID. But e-commerce was on a growth trajectory and our, our industry was looking at it and they were building mills to take those boxes back. So some of it is definitely anticipating the growth in e-commerce and packaging. And the other part of it is just being a natural product and those fibers, you know, coming from trees. We're definitely dealing with a different set of recovery things that than other materials uh, like sure. plastics, for instance. Plastics have, there's just so many types of plastic. And so that's kind of what confuses people generally, right? There's So many rules around all the different materials, glass, steel, aluminum. So there's there's a lot for consumers to keep track of. But I do think paper recycling is inherently a lot simpler, though. Again, we still we still have our challenges. More and more mills are taking paper cups, coffee cups, another source of wonderful fiber, right, that we can get back in the stream. But the, the cups have to be produced in a way and increasingly they are to remove that uh, thin inner plastic lining that keeps your cup from, you know, falling apart. So milk cartons is one you mentioned and anything food packaging related like pizza is always going to feel a little tricky to consumers, but by and large, it's pretty simple. And and then the more that consumers set their homes or their apartments up for recycling, the better their family will get at it. We've seen a lot of data that suggests When you put a a recycling container of some type, if you have second floor, you know, on the second floor, you get those things like toilet paper tubes back and you get back the aspirin uh, packaging or the toothpaste packaging. So making it more accessible, even within the house, also helps increase the amount that consumers will will put back into the stream. So so it's just reminding them that there's a lot of different, you know, touch points um, in the home. To, to get all that fiber back. Marianne, it's fascinating, right? Like the, this theme of make it simple for people in their house and, and, and then understanding what in fact to recycle on its way back to uh, the paper and packaging board and, and all of its partners. I think that really resonates, right? So what we're learning in this series is it, it needs to be simplified And we need to strengthen the infrastructure for both understanding and acting on recycled materials and with recycled materials. So I'm incredibly grateful for your time today. Your passion for this topic is clear. And we are grateful for all you are doing to uh, support recycling and educate people around recycling and packaging recycling uh, here in the U.S. So thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to talking again soon. Thanks, Jenny.
Coming up next, I'm thrilled to bring back my mom, who's coming to the show to help us debunk various recycling myths. She'll be tossing everyday recycling questions my way, and together we'll unravel the answers. Stay tuned because some of these questions might be the same ones you're asking about at home. This is a favorite of mine because um, I have to kind of store my paint inside. So what happens to these old paints that you've had around in your closet? And also, when we're talking about that, what about the chemicals as well? Yeah. Yeah. So that those hazmat material events, you'll see signs posted in your community or get something in your local newsletter or a, or an email from your town, um, all that announcing those uh, hazardous material cleanup days. Those are the days to bring the paints, um, the the chemicals, uh, and they will take all of those off your hands. In fact, as you know, Chuck and I bought an old house that had all of interesting things in the basement. And we just took a big load to the, our hazmat uh, uh, recycling event just, just two weeks ago. All right. We'll put that one down on the calendar. Um, what about old clothing? I mean, mm-hmm. that, that you really can't take to a secondhand store and you really can't put in a clothing bin. So it's just an old shirt. It's got to go. The question is, go where, right? This is one yeah. of the things that we're really talking about. Where does it go? My son, Patrick, your grandson, uh, yes. introduced us to a great company called Four Days. And basically, you can fill a bag that they send on and they uh, recover and refurbish what they can for resale, or they do textile recycling. So they make new fabrics out of the old fabrics. So you can also look too for those clothing Drop-offs, many times they're just called textile drop-offs these days, and they too will take and recycle uh, textiles. There are a couple of brands that'll take your textiles back as well. Um, You know, on the sort of mass market, H&M will take your uh, materials back. And uh, in the sort of older, sophisticated lady line, uh, Eileen Fisher always takes Eileen Fisher clothes back uh, for recycling and store credit. So many, many times your your retailers will start to help you to recycle your fabrics. Ah, so four days. Okay. And that's a wrap for today's episode. I hope you learned something new about the recycling world. I know I did. A heartfelt thank you to all of our Recycling Reality Check partners, including the Paper and Packaging Board, who have made this podcast possible. And one final thought. As we enter the holiday season and paper sustainability becomes top of mind, check out Keep America Beautiful's Keep the Holidays Beautiful eBook, your guide to hosting sustainable holiday or New Year's celebration. Learn how to gift wrap, host a party, and enjoy the holidays more sustainably. You can find the ebook online right now at kab.org. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast, Do Beautiful Things, so you don't miss out when the next episode drops. In the upcoming episodes of the series, we'll delve into the fascinating life cycle of an aluminum can, we'll unravel the science behind PET plastic water bottles and we'll explore many more intriguing topics. Thank you for being with us today. And until next time, take care, stay informed, and let's keep making the world greener and more sustainable. We'll see you on the next episode. And thank you to McCall Friedegg, our producer. Have a great day, everybody.